last month's session filled you technicians in on the changes in the 1970 engines that were designed to make them run more efficiently and a lot cleaner. The heated air intake system was described briefly and the vapor saver was also mentioned. We told you that this month's session would explain the operation and servicing of the heated air intake system and the evaporation control system or vapor saver as it's now commonly referred to. And we're here to keep that promise. I've lined up a couple of boys from the lab who are real experts when it comes to emission control. I think they're through with their little discussion, so let's see if they're ready to give us the lowdown on heated air intake and vapor saver. I'm ready any time you are, fellas. Okay, Tech, we both feel a little honored that you asked us to participate. The first thing to set straight is that the heated air system is not standard on all engines. And the second thing is that there are two different systems, a single snorkel system and a dual snorkel system. You'll find the heated air intake system on all engines except the 340 cubic inch, the 426 Hemi, and the 440s with three two-barrel carburetors. And of course, engines equipped with a fresh air scoop option don't have heated air intake. Engines with two barrel carburetors and the standard 440 New Yorker and Imperial have the single snorkel system. The other four barrel jobs have the dual snorkel system. The extra snorkel on the four barrel engines is a non-heat snorkel that is vacuum operated. Before we go any further, I think that we should explain why the heated air intake system is used on our 1970 engines. With the new air intake system, the air entering the carburetor is heated in cold weather to give warm weather drivability. By using the heated air intake system, it was possible to design the engine, establish ignition timing, and calibrate the carburetion to get good, clean combustion at uniform temperatures instead of compromising to cover a wide range of conditions. Use of this system is a step towards better fuel economy, particularly during winter driving. The reason for this is that the heated air intake system permits leaner air fuel mixtures to control exhaust emissions while maintaining midsummer drivability the year round. Another important advantage is that the system allows faster, more efficient engine warm up with better economy and reduced emissions during warm up. Greg, why don't you explain the blending function of the system while I set these parts up to demonstrate? Okay, Jeff. Uh, first off, you technicians may remember some of what I'm going to say from last month, but I think it's worth covering again. The heated air intake operates as an air blending system, so it stands to reason that there are two airflow circuits. One circuit provides heated air and the other provides underhood air. However, air blending only occurs when underhood temperatures are between approximately 10 and 90 degrees Fahrenheit. I see Jeff has everything set up, so I'll let him take it from here. Let's start with the heated air. This sheet metal stove is attached to the exhaust manifold. Although it is called a stove, it's a scoop to gather air for heating. Air entering the stove is heated as it passes over the hot exhaust manifold. As the air leaves the stove, it goes through a flexible duct into the snorkel or air cleaner inlet. The amount of heated airflow is controlled by a heat control door in the snorkel. When underhood temperatures are below 10 degrees Fahrenheit, the door is up or closed, and you get nothing but heated air. When the temperature rises somewhere above 90 degrees, the door is down or open all the way, and the airflow will be all underhood air. I think our technicians are anxious to know how that door works. The heat control door is operated by a vacuum diaphragm, which opens the door the proper amount to provide the right blend of heated and underhood air. Before we go any further, let's take a look at the entire circuit. Intake air temperature is controlled by a temperature sensitive vacuum valve. Intake manifold vacuum acting on a diaphragm operates the heat control door in the snorkel. Since the whole system is dependent on temperature, let's start at the most logical place. The temperature sensitive part is simply a bimetallic strip attached rigidly at one end that controls a small bleed valve at the other end. This bleed valve is connected to a vacuum chamber at the bottom of the sensor. There are two hose nipples at the bottom of the vacuum chamber. A vacuum hose connects one hose nipple, either one, to the vacuum diaphragm on the snorkel. 
The other hose is connected to the base of the carburetor. When the temperature is lower than about 10 degrees, the bleed valve is closed. Maximum vacuum is applied to the vacuum diaphragm. When the heat control door is all the way up, it blocks off underhood air. However, as the sensor temperature rises, the bleed valve opens gradually. This vents the vacuum chamber and reduces the vacuum on the diaphragm. As vacuum decreases, the spring in the diaphragm housing pushes the control door down to decrease the heated airflow and increase airflow through the snorkel. The object of the heated air intake system is to maintain temperature inside the air cleaner housing at between 90 and 120 degrees Fahrenheit. When the temperature at the sensor goes above 120 degrees, the bleed valve in the sensor opens to provide maximum reduction in the vacuum applied to the diaphragm. Could you tell us how this diaphragm works? It is simply a bellows-type diaphragm mounted in a housing with a spring between the diaphragm and the top of the housing. There's a hose nipple in the side for the vacuum hose from the sensor. The heat control door is operated by a link that is permanently connected to the diaphragm plate in the vacuum diaphragm. Now, since the diaphragm is spring-loaded, it requires at least five inches of vacuum to lift the door off the floor of the snorkel. At nine inches of vacuum, the door will be raised to the top of the snorkel. Because the diaphragm is opposed by a spring, temperature modulation will occur only at road load throttle conditions, or when intake manifold vacuum is above the operating vacuum of the diaphragm. On acceleration, when the throttles are opened wide, the intake manifold vacuum drops, reducing vacuum applied to the diaphragm. The spring then lowers the door to the floor of the snorkel. When the snorkel is wide open, there is less resistance to engine breathing than through the heated air system. I think that we have pretty well explained how the heated air intake system works. Now let's talk about how to check the system to make sure it's working properly. Before you do that, Greg, I think that you better explain the differences between the single and dual snorkel systems. On the dual snorkel air cleaner, one snorkel draws only underhood air and is not affected by the temperature sensor. The other snorkel is connected to the temperature sensor and draws heated air through the stove. It operates exactly the same as the single snorkel air cleaner. The right side air control door is operated by a vacuum diaphragm that is identical to the one on the left side and operates strictly on intake manifold vacuum. The vacuum supply is drawn from a T in the vacuum hose connected to the carburetor. During normal driving, intake manifold vacuum is sufficient to keep the heat control door in the up position. So most of the time, the right snorkel is closed to underhood air intake. However, on heavy throttle acceleration, the intake manifold vacuum drops and the air door starts to open. The spring should start to push the door down when the vacuum drops to about 9 inches. At 5 inches of vacuum, the door should be down all the way to the floor of the snorkel. Both snorkels are then open to underhood air to provide maximum performance. At high engine speed, air velocity creates a pressure drop inside the air cleaner. So we have a higher pressure on one side of the control door, lower pressure on the other. Now this pressure differential tends to open both doors regardless of manifold vacuum. The heated air intake system was designed to provide improved drivability, faster, more efficient engine warm-up, improved economy, and reduced exhaust emissions. And if everything is operating A-OK, -okay, the heated air intake system will accomplish all of these things. Uh, why don't you take a breather, Greg, and I'll explain how to check the heated air intake system to make sure everything is operating properly. If the system isn't functioning properly... Uh, hold it, Jeff. I'm sure our technicians are anxious to hear about testing and diagnosis, but let's give them the opportunity to take a breather, too. While someone turns the record, decide, too. If the heated air intake system is not functioning properly, general performance, and especially efficiency and economy during warm-up, will be affected. And, of course, vehicle exhaust emissions are likely to be increased. The first thing to check is to make sure all vacuum hoses and the flexible hose from the stove are properly attached and in good condition. You will probably never get to check a cold engine in the service garage, but if you do, with the engine cold and an ambient temperature under 90 degrees, 
the door in the snorkel should be all the way up or open to full heated air. Remember, the engine has to be running to provide vacuum at the diaphragm. The exhaust manifold starts to heat the air almost immediately, so watch the heat control door to see if it has started to modulate the amount of heated and underhood air. Warm the engine, including the cooling system, up to operating temperature. At this point, the door should be all the way down for full underhood air. Disconnect the flex duct at the stove and remove the air cleaner. To avoid damaging the flex duct, remove it from the air cleaner. Whenever you remove or install the flex duct, never pull it off or force it on. Always thread it on or off. It takes about two full turns to properly install it. Cool the temperature sensor to below 90 degrees. Remember, without any vacuum, the heat control door will move to the down position and remain there regardless of the temperature at the sensor. Use a long piece of hose to connect the sensor to intake manifold vacuum. The door should move to the up position as when open to heated air. If the door does not rise to the heated air position, check the vacuum diaphragm to make sure it is operating properly. Don't you have to have a vacuum pump to perform this check? Not necessarily, Tech. You can use intake manifold vacuum, but for a complete test, you need a shutoff device, a bleed valve, and a vacuum gauge connected in that order. Connect the vacuum test hose directly to the diaphragm rather than the temperature sensor. Be sure the shutoff is open and the bleed valve closed so that full manifold vacuum will be applied to the diaphragm. Of course, if you can't register full manifold vacuum on the gauge, it's a pretty good indication that you have a bad diaphragm. When the gauge shows that you have full manifold vacuum, close off the vacuum line. The diaphragm vacuum should not drop more than 10 inches in two minutes. After checking for leaks, remove the shutoff and release the vacuum by opening the bleed valve. Build the vacuum slowly by gradually closing the bleed valve and observe the heat control door operation. The heat control door should start to lift off the floor of the snorkel at not less than five inches of vacuum. As you continue to build vacuum, the door should lift to the full up position by the time you reach nine inches of vacuum. How do you check the right side of the dual snorkel job? You haven't mentioned it. Same way, Tech. Of course, you don't have any temperature sensor to check. I'm going to let Greg tell the technicians how to replace the diaphragm or sensor if they do not perform properly. Okay, Jeff. First, remove the vacuum hose. And then bend the forward lock tab straight down. Lift the diaphragm until the lock tab clears the slot. Slide the unit forward to disengage the rear lock tab. Then move to the right to unhook the operating rod from the control door. With the diaphragm removed, check the door for freedom of travel. Lift the door to the up position or top of the snorkel. When you let go of it, it should fall freely to the floor of the snorkel. And if it doesn't, check the snorkel sidewalls for interference or deposits of foreign matter. And check the hinge and the hinge pin for deposits. On the outside of the snorkel, make sure there has been no physical damage in the area of the hinge pin. If necessary, remove any foreign matter such as paint blobs, burrs, or whatever from snorkel sidewall or door edges. And make sure the door works freely without binding. To install the vacuum diaphragm, reverse the removal procedure. But before you bend the front lock tab, apply manifold vacuum to the diaphragm while holding it against the snorkel and bend the front lock tab. Make sure the door operates freely by applying and releasing vacuum. Why can't you just move the heat control door by hand? That's not a good idea, Tech. You might cock the rod or diaphragm and restrict the operation of the door. If the diaphragm has been cocked, it can be recentered by applying vacuum. Reconnect the vacuum hose to the diaphragm and install the air cleaner on the vehicle. Before you install the air cleaner, make sure that all vacuum hoses are fully seated. The heat sensor is pretty simple to replace. Disconnect the vacuum hoses and remove the retainer clips. Remove the temperature sensor with the gasket and discard both. To install the new sensor, position a new gasket on the sensor and install the sensor. When installing the sensor, push against the vacuum chamber and not the guard. 
Install new retainer clips securely to compress the gasket and form an air seal. And here's a couple of warnings. Don't ever put any pressure on the guard. You will damage the sensor. And another thing, don't make any attempt to adjust the temperature sensor. Install the air cleaner on the car and make sure the door opens as the engine warms up. That about wraps up the heated air intake system, Tech. Well done. Jeff looks like he'll explode soon if he doesn't get his two cents worth in. So I'll let him start on the evaporation control system. Okay, Tech. 1970 Chrysler cars and light trucks sold in California have the evaporation control system. And soon in the future will be standard production all over. The evaporation control system reduces loss of fuel vapors by evaporation. The system has been dubbed the Vapor Saver, and that's what we'll call it from here on. The Vapor Saver is a closed system that prevents loss of fuel vapors from the fuel tank or carburetor through evaporation or expansion. The vapors pass through vent lines to the crankcase inlet air cleaner. Since fuel vapors are about twice as heavy as air, they settle in the crankcase above the oil. However, when the engine is running, the fuel vapors and the normal crankcase vapors are purged from the crankcase. Crankcase vapors are vented through the positive crankcase ventilation system, which is an existing part of the cleaner air system. Intake manifold vacuum acting on the crankcase vent tube draws the vapors through the PCV valve through the base of the carburetor into the intake manifold. In the event of a plugged crankcase vent valve or excessive blow-by, Vapors are vented into the air cleaner. This way, all crankcase vapors are burned by engine combustion. Let's take a look at the fuel tank. There is a small overfill limiter tank inside the main fuel tank. The passage entering the limiter tank from the main tank is very small. The limiter tank fills much slower than the main tank. When the main tank is being filled, very little fuel flows into the limiter tank. After filling, Fuel continues the flow into the limiter tank. This relieves the overfill condition and prevents fuel loss due to expansion. Internal vent lines at the upper corners of the fuel tank are connected to a vapor liquid separator by rubber hoses. On passenger cars, the separator is simply a piece of two inch tubing that internally holds the four vent lines from the tank and a vent line which leads to the crankcase air cleaner. The setup is slightly different on wagons, which is explained in the reference book. The vent lines are at different heights, so that the tank will always be vented regardless of vehicle attitude. The shortest vent line is to return liquid fuel that may enter the separator during maneuvering or inclined parking. Because liquids are heavier than vapors, they will settle to the bottom of the separator. The vent line to the crankcase is at the top of the separator. This minimizes liquid transfer to the crankcase. The fuel tank is also equipped with a filler cap that will only release fuel vapors at a specific pressure or let air enter at a specific vacuum. The cap is identified by the words pressure and vacuum, and for the system to remain effective, must be replaced with the same type. I see here in the service manual that there's a hose from the carburetor to the crankcase air cleaner. Is that for fuel vapors too? Right, Tech. On eight-cylinder engines, the float bowls in the carburetor are vented to the crankcase through the crankcase air cleaner. On the six-cylinder models, the hose from the fuel bowl is vented to the crankcase through a passage in the fuel pump. The six-cylinder fuel pump also has a bleed device that prevents pressure buildup between the fuel pump and the carburetor. This improves hot starting. By the way, Jeff, six-cylinder engines without the vapor saver use a fuel pump that has the bleed device but does not have the vapor passage. If it is necessary to replace a fuel pump, make sure that you install the correct one. And a nice thing about the vapor saver is that it shouldn't require any maintenance in normal service. Well, fellas, I think we're pretty close to running out of time. You two have covered the heated air intake system and the vapor saver clearly and thoroughly. But before we wrap it up, I want to encourage you technicians to read your reference books from cover to cover. I'm sure you know by now that there will be some additional information that we didn't have time for on the film. See you at the next session.